We're coming up on three years since I started this podcast. And when I started it, I didn't know that by the time we got done, Israel would be attacked in the largest one-day massacre of Jewish people since World War II. I didn't know that Israel would be engulfed in a literal war with the Palestinian terrorists who've been seeking to overthrow it for decades. And I didn't know we'd be seeing Ezekiel 35 being repeated so vividly right before our eyes. But that's exactly what's going on. And the battle that you see playing out in the Middle East right now is a battle that started not on October 7th of 2023, but all the way back in the book of Genesis. So how did all of this start? And where is all this going? I can't wait to tell you about it today on the Cross References Podcast. Welcome to the Book of Ezekiel, a cross-references Bible study where we learn how every small piece of the Bible tells one big story and how they all connect to the cross and Christ. My name is Luke Taylor, and I just got back from a trip to the mountains of Colorado. Well, the the trip was last month, but it's all still fresh on my mind. It's kind of comical to me, actually, that whenever you look at the mountains that we have in the Rockies, or if you look at the mountains in the Himalayas or some of the other famous mountain regions, they are so huge. Like in Colorado, it could take you hours just to drive the circumference of a mountain. Literally hours. And then you look at the mountains of Israel that are spoken of in the Bible. Mount Hermon or the Mountain of Olives. And and they're quite a bit smaller than what I normally think of when I think of mountains. (laughs) I say it's comical because, I you know, even in Missouri where I live, we wouldn't even call some of those mountains. We'd, We'd call them hills. So it always cracks me up a little bit. I see pictures of mountains at the Middle East, and um, they're certainly not what I'm expecting whenever I think of a mountain. Now, while these mountains that we read about in Scripture, they're not significant because of their size, but they are significant because of historical reasons, for spiritual reasons. And we're going to be reading about one of those today, Mount Seir, the subject of Ezekiel 35. We're going to cover all of Ezekiel 35 on this episode. It's not a long chapter. It's really just here to set the stage for chapter 36. Um, but, and I, I, I'll just mention up front, I, I'm probably going to go a little bit longer than normal this time. And this is why I took last week off. I knew that this was going to be a big study. It was going to go into a lot of history. So I really needed that extra week to do this study time. And um, well, here it is for you. <laughs> so Ezekiel 35 today, evangelist Jimmy DeYoung, he passed away a few years ago, but he describes the book of Ezekiel in two major chunks retribution, and restoration. So chapters 1 through 32 are the chapters of retribution. There were 24 of them about God's retribution against Israel, followed by eight chapters of retribution against the Gentile nations. Then we get into what I'm describing as the much more positive side of the book, chapters 33 through 48. And this is the message of restoration. This is the part people really like to focus on, when they study Ezekiel. But chapter 35, it stands out a little bit in this section. This is a chapter about God bringing the hammer down heavily on the nation of Edom. Now you say, well, why is this message of harsh judgment over here in the happy part of the book? Like this sounds like it would belong in the retribution section. Well, the answer is that a message of harsh judgment is good whenever it's falling on your enemies. And these people, the Edomites, they are Israel's historic enemies of old. It's almost like Israel's arch enemies, in a way. I know Babylon had just wiped out Israel, but they're kind of like the world's arch enemies. They're a problem for everybody. Edom was much more the arch enemy specifically of Israel. And no nation receives more condemnation from God in the Old Testament than Edom. So who is Edom? Well, let's start into today's verses, and we'll find out. Ezekiel 35, verses 1 through 4. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face against Mount Seir, and prophesy against it, and say to it, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Mount Seir, and I will stretch out my hand against you, and I will make you a desolation and a waste. I will lay your cities waste, and you shall become a desolation, 
and you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, before I get into talking about Mount Seir, there's actually a parallel to something that we've studied earlier in Ezekiel chapter 6. That chapter started out, The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Set your face toward the mountains of Israel and prophesy against them. And this chapter started out with kind of similar language, almost the exact same, a little bit inverted. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Set your face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it. So, as I said before, some are going to ask why chapter 35, this negative and condemning chapter, shows up right here in the positive and happy section of this book. And like I said, the reason is that God is taking revenge against Israel's enemies, and so that's a reason right here for Israel to take some great relief. Now you say, but wait a minute. I thought that Christians weren't supposed to take revenge. Well, that is true, but God does take revenge on our behalf. Romans 12, 19, it says, Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. So it's God's job to take revenge, and he will. But first, judgment must come to the house of, of the Lord. In the Old Testament con <laughs> context, this was Jerusalem. That's where chapter 6 came in. That's where it was prophesying to the mountains of Israel first. And by now, Israel has been dealt with. Okay, God has brought judgment to his house. Now he's turning his attention to Israel's enemies, those who also deserve it. And this is where Mount Seir comes in. So you can take some comfort in the fact that for you, for every time you've been mistreated, you don't have to avenge yourself. God will step in and take revenge. That's God's job. You, your job is to worry about your own sins and forgive your enemies, and God will take care of them. So you might be wondering who Mount Seir is. And this is an easy mystery to solve, okay? We're going to cross-reference this with Genesis 25. It all started with a couple of twin boys who were born to Isaac. Genesis 25, verses 21 through 26. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her. And she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other, the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out all red, all his body like a hairy cloak. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. A key aspect today is the word or the color red. That's what Esau means, red. And you kind of see this as a sort of theme color as you study Esau and his descendants. Uh, it, it reminds me, I was just watching one of the worst Star Wars movies the other day. I was watching The Last Jedi. I was watching it because, basically, <laughs> because I hate myself. <laughs> that might be the best reason to say why I was watching The Last Jedi. The reason I put myself through that my son and I had just watched episode seven and episode seven, uh, which is, it's a much better movie. It's a pretty good movie. That one kind of ends on a cliffhanger. And so we went ahead and watched episode eight. I would have liked him to just think it ended with episode seven and that there was never a Star Wars movie again after that. Um, but uh, like I said, it ends on a cliffhanger. I didn't want to like leave it right there. So we watched The Last Jedi. And it's, that is one of the most infuriating movies for me as a longtime Star Wars fan. Watching it this time, I think, made me angrier than I've ever been before. Um, this movie is so horrible from like a storyline perspective. And yet it is such a beautiful movie that I just can't help but tear my I can barely tear my eyes away from it. Like every shot is just framed so perfectly. It is one of the best looking blockbusters of all time. The story's awful, but it's just beautiful to look at. And one of the most visually striking things of that film is the use of the color red. It, its use of red is just mesmerizing. And so, you know, just as someone who appreciates, I don't know, artfulness and how stuff is filmed, um, I really appreciate the theme color of red throughout that movie. And it was just kind of a coincidence watching that movie. And I'm also studying this, this chapter here lately about Edom, and that is their theme color. You're going to see the color red come up a lot in today's lesson. Um, 
it started here with Esau. His name was Esau because he comes out hairy and red. And that's basically what, what Esau means. And you, as you read Esau's later uh, story, we're, we won't read it all today, but he sells his birthright for a red stew. And um, it's just a color that comes up a lot in his life and in his descendants' lives. So let's skip ahead to chapter 36. We're not going to read Esau's whole story because this is not really about Esau the man today, but it's about those who came after him. So is Genesis 36, starting at verses 1 and 2. These are the generations of Esau, that is, Edom. It puts that in parentheses right there in my Bible. Esau, that is, Edom. Esau took his wives from the Canaanites. And so just note right there before we go on, Esau is given a second name right here, which is a kind of a common thing with Bible characters. They will often have two names. And I don't always know why there's a second name. Paul, also known as Saul, um, there's lots of, lots of people in the Bible who will go by two different names. And it, Jacob, his name was changed to Israel. That's where the, the name Israel comes from. It came from God, changing his name. So Esau had a second name. Esau, that is Edom, which is, a, again, it's, it's, it's very similar to the Hebrew word for red, which is Adom. Verse 6, we're just getting down to verse 6 of Genesis 36. Then Esau took his wives, his sons, his daughters, and all the members of his household, his livestock, all his beasts, and all his property that he had acquired in the land of Canaan. He went into a land away from his brother Jacob. For their possessions were too great for them to dwell together. The land of their sojournings could not support them because of their livestock. So Jacob and Esau, they couldn't live near each other because they, bu- they had these big growing families and the land couldn't handle all of them and all of their cattle. So Jacob settled in the land of Israel. He had the 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. Esau went somewhere else. Verse 8. So Esau settled in the hill country of Seir. Esau is Edom. It just puts that parenthetical thought right there again, right there in my Bible. I don't know how it's translated in your Bible, but it just says right there, Esau is Edom. So Jacob, as I said, he had a second name, which was Israel. His descendants would be known as the Israelites. Esau's second name was Edom. His descendants would be known as the Edomites. And their land was known as Seir. Seir would be located today in the lower part of the nation of Jordan. And that is the Mount Seir that Ezekiel is directing his attention to in Ezekiel 35. The descendants of Esau. So what is the problem with the descendants of Esau? Well, the Edomites instantly became a thorn in Israel's side, and this went on for centuries. When Israel was traveling from Egypt to the Promised Land, they requested to travel through Edom to save them some time. They weren't asking to impose anything on Edom. They just wanted to pass through. But Edom said no. And that was the beginning of a long and contentious relationship between these two nations. And it even became violent at times. And when it came to Ezekiel's day, and Babylon came in and they conquered Jerusalem, the Edomites just had a party about it. It it was schadenfreude. They were having glee at an enemy's failure or destruction. And so they clapped their hands, they danced around, and they watched gleefully as King Nebuchadnezzar burnt Jerusalem. Now let's get back to Ezekiel 35, and we'll pick it up at verse 5 where we left off. It said, this is God speaking to Edom, because you cherished perpetual enmity. (laughs) That phrase, it almost kind of cracks me up. Think about this phrase. You cherished perpetual enmity. Okay, it means they loved to hate the Jews. They loved to hate them. It's just kind of a poetic way to put it. They cherished perpetual enmity. Like, if you ever want to create a Hallmark card for your arch enemy, just just use that phrase in there, okay? I have cherished perpetual enmity against you. Um, But what is this talking about? Like, on a more serious note, it's talking about anti-Semitism. This is something that is different from just regular old racism that you see everywhere in the world. Jew hatred is just something that's a different form of racism because it's so illogical. I think any racism is illogical. But Jew hatred just takes it to the next level. 
I think there could only be spiritual or satanic reasons behind it. I, I just as I survey the world, there's people all over the world who just can't stand the Jews. And there's such a tiny little, I mean, statistically, by population number, insignificant part of the world population. There's very few Jewish people in comparison to almost anyone else. And yet it's like all these problems get blamed on the Jews. They get blamed for all kinds of issues in the world when they're just a tiny, tiny little section of the population. I just think there's got to be something spiritual or satanic behind it. Uh, and I'll just mention this here too. They're not even problem causers. They, they don't even... The, you, almost any other race, you could probably find bigger problems than what the Jewish people contribute to the world. Jewish people mainly contribute good things to the world. New inventions, new discoveries, scientific greatness, academic achievements and inventions that Jewish people bring a lot of blessing to the world. And yet, what does the world do? It cherishes perpetual enmity against them. And every time I talk about stuff like this, I get comments from these anti-Semites who are telling me why I'm wrong. Every time I talk about this, I get these comments of, of all these people who are, it sounds like they're frothing at the mouth as they bang away on their keyboard, okay? When I read that stuff, I think these people are controlled by evil spirits. Now, I do appreciate you all driving up my download numbers, okay? <laughs> I do appreciate that. <laughs> But man, if you speak in favor of the Jews, it brings the anti-Semites just out of the woodwork. But listen, guys, if you get your blood boiling because somebody speaks of the Jews favorably or speaks of them as victims because of the, the carnage that's been unleashed against them, if that gets your blood boiling to point that out, that is the influence of an evil spirit who's pulling your strings. We saw it in our own country of America this past week as Benjamin Netanyahu came to speak to our Congress. So I don't understand why so often what I'm speaking about in Ezekiel will just line up with what's going on in the real world at that time. It's, it blows my mind. But um, when I started, you know, two weeks ago, when I started studying for Ezekiel 35, I didn't know we were actually going to have the leader of the Jewish state come and speak in our own country. And what's even more shocking, though, is that our own president refused to meet with him. And then our vice president, who is running for president right now, she refused to attend his address. It's just absolutely disgusting that we treat one of our supposed allies in this way. And the protesters who were outside of Congress as this speech was going on, they were spraying graffiti, they were burning American flags, they were mad that our Congress would host the Prime Minister of Israel. There is just no other world leader who could draw this kind of scorn and vitriol from visiting our country. Like you, I'm sure they literally could have invited the terrorist president of Iran to come speak at our Congress, and you would not have seen the backlash outside like what we saw with Benjamin Netanyahu coming, okay? They would not have been burning American flags outside, even if we let a literal terrorist come speak to our Congress. There's just no comparison to the way that the Jewish people are treated and their leader being treated as he this tiny little itty bitty country in the Middle East that doesn't worship Allah. That's just too much for the rest of the world to handle, apparently. They have to have this frothing at the mouth hatred outside because he comes and talks to us. There's just no logical reason for that kind of reaction. This is a spiritual thing, okay? They cherish perpetual enmity. Let's go back to verse 5. Because you cherished perpetual enmity and gave over the people of Israel to the power of the sword at the time of their calamity, at the time of their final punishment, therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God, I will prepare you for blood, and blood shall pursue you. Because you did not hate bloodshed, therefore, blood shall pursue you. Blood, blood, blood brings to mind the color red, right? Like God is painting a picture right here. The Edomites, as I said, they were cheering from the sidelines as they watched Babylon take Jerusalem. And God is warning them right here that they will feel the same pain that Israel felt. Verses 7 through 9. I will make Mount Seir a waste and a desolation, and I will cut off from it all who come and go. And I will fill its mountains with the slain. On your hills and in your valleys and in all your ravines, those slain with the sword shall fall. I will make you a perpetual desolation 
and your city shall not be inhabited. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So these prophecies have literally come true. Edom as a nation was wiped out. It was totally demolished. Edom ceased to exist as its own nation. Israel, in comparison, they lost control of their land. They didn't get it back for literally until about 75 years ago in 1948. For over 2,000 years, Israel had lost their land. But for Edom, after they were wiped out, they never got their land back. There's no Edomites today. This prophecy literally came true. If you go to old Edomite cities, they are just ruins. Now let's pause here for a minute for a mailbag comment. And it's a mailbag comment that came in all the way back, I think in November. Because um, I was going through Ezekiel, I think 25 back then, and it mentioned destruction on the Edomites. And we got this comment. I think this was from our friend Joe out in North Carolina. He's written to the podcast before. I made a comment back then that there's no Edomites today. Now that's true in one sense, but it's also not true in another sense, okay? It's true that there's no Edomites today because there's no Edom, but there are people who've descended from the Edomites and you can kind of trace their lineage through history. So back in November, Joe, I think it was Joe, and I apologize if it was someone else who said this. I'm, I'm just kind of going off of memory right here. But someone pointed out that the Edomites are the Edomians. So what does that mean? Well, let's go through some history today. Let's go back to Genesis 36, and we're going to look at verses 9 through 12. These are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in the hill country of Seir. These are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau. Reuel, the son of Basemath, the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatim, and Kenaz. Timnah was a concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son. And then here's the key part. I know I'm throwing a lot of weird names at you right now, but here's the key part I want you to take away. She bore Amalek to Eliphaz. So it's telling us here that Esau had a grandson named Amalek. If Amalek sounds familiar, it's because there was another tribe or, or nation of people who opposed Israel in the Old Testament, and they were called the Amalekites. Exodus 17 actually has a, this is a kind of a famous story. It's where um, the Israelites were fighting these people, and as long as Moses had his like hands, maybe his staff lifted up in the air, the Israelites would be winning. And every time Moses put his arms down, Israel would start losing. And I think it was Joshua and some other guy, they helped Moses to hold his arms up to get them through that battle. And um, in Israel won. So you might remember that story. Well, the people that they were fighting in that story were the Amalekites or Amalekites. Not sure how to say it, but they had many tussles with um, is between Israel and Amalek in their history. And in 1 Samuel 15, we meet the king of the Amalekites, and his name was Agag. There's a whole story about him and King Saul. I'm not going to get into it all today. But the king of the Amalekites at that time was Agag. Then in the book of Esther, you have this story of an evil man named Haman, and he tried to make a deal with the king to kill all the Jews. And this was hundreds of years later when Persia ruled. And this was even after Ezekiel's day. Who was this guy, Haman, who had this plot to kill the Jews? Where did he come from? Well, Esther 3, 1 tells us, After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, to, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. It said that he was Haman, the Agagite. This man descended from the Amalekites. Even though Israel has basically wiped out the Amalekites as a nation, and I believe that was back there in 1 Samuel 15, there were still some descendants who hung around and caused trouble for the Israelites. And if you read the book of Esther, you know that he almost got all of them wiped out. So Agag and the Amalekites, they descended from Esau as well. And we see this recurring theme in scripture, that the descendants of Esau, they were always being hated on. I'm sorry, they were always being hateful to the descendants of Jacob. And so that's what inspired another famous verse. And you see it in Malachi, and I think it's quoted later in Romans, where it says, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. That's God saying that, by the way. Well, Esau the man, he wasn't really such a bad guy. 
Like you could argue, I think, that Jacob was more of a scoundrel than Esau was. So it's kind of a strange statement here. Why would God say that he hated Esau and he loved Jacob? Well, it was actually talking about nations right there. It was talking about the descendants of Jacob and Esau. And I know that opens up like a whole other issue of <laughs> God saying that he hated someone or, or hated a whole nation. I don't have time to get into it today. Maybe I'll tack it, tackle it someday on my weird stuff in the Bible con uh, podcast, because that's kind of a, that is a, a sticky, a tricky, sticky verse right there. So maybe I'll open that one up later. But anyway, um, it's talking about nations when God says that. And part of God's issue with the descendants of Esau is how they treated the descendants of Jacob. Uh, by the way, Haman had a descendant who became another famous Bible character as well, Herod. Herod was an Edomian. What or Edomian? What, who were the Edomians? Edomians. <laughs> it starts with an I this time. Who were they? Where did they come from? Well, let's back up again to the Edomites. As I said earlier, no other nation in the Old Testament received as many pronouncements of judgment as the Edomites did. That's what the whole entire one chapter book of Obadiah is telling us about. Um, Obadiah was written specifically against the Edomites. And for the same reason that Ezekiel 35 was written right here, it was to put them on notice that since they pointed and laughed whenever Israel fell, God would make sure that they fell as well. So the nation of Edom was wiped out. This happened in the fifth century BC. And they were wiped out by the Babylonian king, Nabonidus. And after this, they were not known as Edom anymore. They lost their national sovereignty, and they never got it back. So they were conquered by King Nabonidus, and that land became known as the land of the Nabataeans. Nabonidus and the Nabataeans. And um, the Edomites were forced to go and live in a different location, southern Judah. So back into the land of Israel. And just as Ezekiel 35 and Obadiah predicted, their cities are just ruins now, never inhabited again. You can visit them today. The most famous city of Edom was Petra. There's actually strong evidence that Petra is going to play a role in the end times. It's going to be a hiding place for the Jews who are running from the Antichrist. We're not going to get into that today, but just kind of an interesting factoid there. What's interesting about Petra is that it's named the Rose City. There's that color red showing up again. In fact, to make another Star Wars reference, um, the movie Rogue One, which is another one of the few good Star Wars things that Disney has produced, <laughs> Rogue One was actually filmed partially um, there in uh, Petra. The first third of the movie Rogue One takes place on a planet called Jeddah. It's this sandy red planet. Well, that was filmed in the place that Ezekiel 35 is talking about, Mount Seir. It's right there near Petra. And you can also see Petra itself in the climax of the third Indiana Jones movie. It's called Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. If you Google Im any images of Petra, you will recognize it if you've seen that movie. It's the same place where the climax of Indiana Jones 3 takes place. So um, back to the Edomites. They lost their home, and they couldn't stay in what was now the land of the Nabataeans. So they were moved, and they became known as the Idumeans. Edomite sounds kind of like Idumean, so it's, it's actually pretty similar. But this was a big loss of national identity. And um, the Edomeans, they were eventually put in a place of leadership in that region by the Romans. And so this brings us to Herod. Herod was considered Jewish. Okay, not Jewish, <laughs> but Jew-ish. <laughs> That's because, because he had a family history that, you know, just like the Israelites, he could trace his lineage back to Abraham. He just came through Esau instead of coming through Jacob. So he was considered Jew-ish. And because of his Jewishness, the Romans decided that he might be more acceptable as a leader over the region of uh, Israel at the time that the Romans were in occupation of that land, which was back during the days of Jesus. So the Herods, they were placed in charge of Judea by the Romans, and he was given the title of King Herod. He was really more of, I, I, you might call him a governor, perhaps, 
but um, they let him have the title of King Herod. And so he was placed in charge of the Jewish land. And so King Herod, of course, is very familiar to Bible readers. There were multiple King Herods, actually. One killed John the Baptist, one killed James, and one of them was King Herod at the time. These were three different King Herods, but one of them was the King Herod at the time Jesus was born. He literally tried to kill the Messiah. He had all the babies in Bethlehem killed at the beginning of the New Testament because he was trying to wipe out the Messiah. But Jesus survived because he had already been taken away safely to Egypt. And again, we just see this recurring theme throughout Scripture. Descendants of Esau keep trying to kill the descendants of Jacob. Now, why? Why are they doing this? Is this something that's literally written into their DNA that they must like, <laughs> you know, they're activated like sleeper agents or something? No. Okay, I think there is a spiritual thing going on. And I'm not, when I say that, I don't mean to say that any descendant of Esau doesn't have free will and can't decide for themselves what they're going to do. They make their own decisions, but they are probably influenced by evil spirits. And I'd say there's some evil spirits who've been placed in charge over the descendants of Esau. Okay, kind of like territorial spirits. I've talked about that before, how there's certain fallen angels who are assigned ownership over certain regions of the earth. And the interesting thing that we're going to see about this particular conflict with the descendants of Esau, it really doesn't matter what territory that they live in because they get moved around sometimes, but they continually have this same hatred and this desire to wipe the Jews out. So does all of this that I've been saying, does this have any modern application to the conflicts that are going on with the Jews and Israel today? Well, you might be surprised to find out that yes, the descendants of Esau are still causing problems for the Jewish people in modern times. Or maybe you won't be surprised about that at all. Okay, like I don't find it all that surprising. <laughs> but, but anyway, we're going to analyze that today. So let me take a short break. I'm going to get a drink. And whenever I come back, we're going to finish up today's verses and we're going to answer that question. Next time on this podcast, we will continue right along with the book of Ezekiel, and we're going to start into chapter 36. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but chapter thir chapter 35 here is really just kind of a setup for some greater prophecies that are to come in chapter 36. And so um, that chapter, I think it'll take me two lessons to get through that chapter, but I'm really excited to get into it. It's going to actually intersect with some stuff that I just that I feel like God's been showing me in my personal life. And so anyway, make sure that you're subscribed and you'll be able to get that episode. Uh, if you want to send me an email, you can send it to, <laughs> might be some hate mail today, but you can send it to crossreferencespodcast at gmail.com. Or if you're following along on YouTube, you can leave a comment there. And um, I usually see those as well. So we're going to read the last of today's verses in just a few minutes. Let me go ahead and finish up the history lesson that I was doing then we'll get into the final verses after that, okay? I hope you're finding this interesting. So let's talk about the Idumeans. Um, the, these were the people that King Herod came from, but of, of ancient times, they would be the Edomites. So when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, once again, the Jews were scattered. This time they were scattered by the Romans. And the Idumeans, they were scattered as well, because like I said, they were Jew-ish. And so they got deported to a land that is up, it was up north of the Israel region. It is known today as Bosnia. If you look at Bosnia on a map, it's in a region that's called the Balkans in Europe. Uh, it'll be north of Greece and kind of northeast of Italy. Bosnia, this is the nation that it actually kind of cracks me up sometimes. Well, actually, I feel sorry for it <laughs> when I look at the map. Um, this is the country that, that Croatia is right next to it. And Croatia just does not want to let Bosnia have a beach. <laughs> if you go, go look this up if you get a chance. Okay, I don't know the whole story here of how they drew the borders. But it's like Croatia just almost comically, they wrap around Bosnia to the extent that Bosnia 
gets no coastline pretty much. Okay. If you're in Bosnia and if you want to go to the beach, you're, you're <laughs> too bad. Okay. Croatia says no beach for you. So um, anyway, the Idumeans, they were relocated to Bosnia. And that is where they stayed for almost 2000 years. It's kind of interesting. All these biblical nations, they just kind of like, it's like they went on pause for the past 2000 years. And they only started to get active and move around again here in the past like 100 years. It's kind of weird how that happened. You know, almost, almost seems kind of dispensational, right? <laughs> I'll make some people mad by saying that. So nearly 100 years ago, Hitler decides he wants to strike up a partnership with the leader of the Bosnian Idumeans, and which are not called Idumeans by this point, but that's what they were. His, th this leader was named Haj Amin al-Husseini, and Hitler said that if they partnered with him, they would rid the planet of, quote, world Jewry. And so in 1943, these Bosnian Idumeans, they became a fighting force for Hitler of about 25,000 men. However, they never accomplished anything for Hitler. The U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's website describes them as generally ineffective. And then, of course, the war ended within a couple years of this partnership even being established. And so they ended and really make a big splash. I'm just pointing it out. If it's kind of just kind of interesting. Once again, the descendants of, of Esau wanted to attack and wipe out the descendants of Jacob. Amin al-Husseini, he had a nephew named Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat was the leader of something called the PLO, or the Palestinian Liberation Organization. This was a group that said they wanted to get this region of Israel to be for themselves, and they wanted to recognize it as another, yet another independent Muslim nation in the Middle East. They wanted to call it Palestine. Now, they said that they always had Palestine, that it was their historic homeland. In reality, there has never been a nation of Palestine in history. It's not a historic nation. The Romans just came up with that name to taunt the Jewish people because it sounded like Philistine. And so the so-called Palestinians, like I said, I guess they decided that there's just not enough Muslim nations in the Middle East. They want to take this one piece of land that was given to the Jews to reestablish Israel. Arafat wasn't even from quote unquote Palestine. He was from Egypt. He had no like right to claim the land of Israel for himself. He he was an Egyptian, like I said. And um he he was just motivated by anti-Semitism and hate. And and he you know the rest of the story. You can find linkages from Esau all the way back to the Amalekites and the Edomites. And if you you can trace that all the way up to today if you want. Now, some of you are saying, look, 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 it's been 2,000 years since then. There's nothing meaningful about training, tracing someone's lineage all the way back there. Because, you know, in 2,000 years, we've all intermingled and intermarried, and our, our bloodlines are all so intermingled. It doesn't really mean all that much after thousands of years have passed. And you know what? I'm not even going to argue with you on that. Okay, like, I have no disagreement with you. Yeah, there are probably millions upon millions of people today who could trace their heritage back to Esau. Like if you followed the family tree, maybe most people in the world could. Okay, no doubts about that. Like if we had perfect genealogical records for all of us. Yeah, I bet we are all pretty well intermingled by this point. So I'm not even going to argue with you on that. What I find this interesting is from more of a spiritual point of view, that there have always been these descendants of Esau and they just act in the exact same way against the descendants of Jacob, just as it was prophesied back in Genesis 25, that they have always reviled them, refused to let them have their land, cheered their destruction, tried to divide Israel. It's a spirit that just, and I believe it's a demonic spirit, or a fallen angel who's in control of these people, influencing them. No matter where they live, they just always seem to act this same way. And so I want to talk about that as we read the last verses of today's chapter. Because regardless of what you believe about the Edomites in modern times and whether they're like a one-to-one -one manifestation of the Edomites of the Edomians themselves, I see a Edomite spirit that is at work in the world. 
And I believe those, it really doesn't matter what your nationality is, anybody who invites it and follows it and is influenced by it is going to attract the same judgment to their lives that the Edomites did here in Ezekiel 35. So let's read the rest of the chapter, because I like I've been a bit derailed here lately on this history lesson. Verse 10 probably has the most confusing line of this chapter. Ezekiel 35, 10. Because you said, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will take possession of them, although the Lord was there. Let me pause there. So the Edomites say that they want to take control of, quote, these two nations and these two countries. So some wonder if this is referring to all of Israel right here, because Israel, for a large chunk of the Old Testament, it had been divided into two nations. There was the northern and the southern kingdom. So this seems kind of maybe what you'd call conventional wisdom, that that's what it's talking about. That could be. It doesn't quite sit right with me, because so far throughout the book of Ezekiel, that's not a way that Israel has been characterized. Uh, Plus, by the time we get to Ezekiel's day, the northern tribes, they'd been wiped out long ago. So it just doesn't quite make sense to to refer or for Edom to refer to the, to Israel as these two nations. So maybe that's what they mean. I don't know. I just seem a little doubtful. But what else could they mean? Well, I would say this. At a minimum, at least Israel, they're one of the nations that's referred to here. But maybe it's their vocabulary about it that's so offensive to God. They are declaring it mine. They're declaring it theirs, their own possession. And this country was supposed to be God's possession. As one of my commentaries said, the tenants may have been evicted, but God was still the landlord. So by them claiming ownership of that which belonged to God, Edom was drawing a lot of anger from God. Verse 11, Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God, I will deal with you according to the anger and envy that you showed because of your hatred against them. And I will make myself known among them when I judge you. And you shall know that I am the Lord. I have heard all the revilings that you uttered against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate, they are given us to devour. And you magnified yourselves against me with your mouth, and multiplied your words against me. I heard it. Thus says the Lord God, While the whole world rejoices, I will make you desolate. As you rejoiced over the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so I will deal with you. You shall be desolate, Mount Seir, and all Edom, all of it. Then they will know that I am the Lord. So the fact that they declared their ownership over God's land, this made God very angry. Of course it would. And so this problem, this is something that carries all the way up through today. People keep trying to divide God's land of Israel and not let the Jews have it. A popular phrase that you hear, especially before the Trump presidency, you would often hear about something called the two-state solution that this was a way that they were going to divide the land of Israel. And that sure sounds a lot like what the Edomites were saying right here, calling it these two nations. I don't think that God likes it very much when people suggest breaking up Israel and taking ownership of it. So it's kind of scary. I don't want to say I'm living in fear or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. But let me just use this phrase. It's a little scary as an American to witness what we saw happen in our nation's capital this past week, that the prime minister of an ally to the United States came to visit and people were outside burning American flags. And I saw they'd created this giant paper mache figure that was supposed to represent Netanyahu, but it tried to make him look like a demon with blood flowing from its mouth. I mean, it looked like something straight out of Hitler's Germany. And um, something else interesting on CNN this past week, somebody floated the idea that Kamala Harris, that she might pick Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro to be her running mate for the election this November. And one of the CNN hosts, I think it was John King, he stated that Democrats would never go for that because Josh Shapiro is Jewish. And so he just stated this as a fact. He's just openly acknowledging the anti-Semitism that is rampant in the Democratic Party, that they would not accept a Jewish leader these days. And I'm just like, wow, like, I just can't believe he's just going to blurt that out just openly, just just casually. Yeah. 
The, the Democrats are not going to pick a Jew to be their leader. It, I'm, well, I say openly. Okay, he said it on CNN, so it's not like he said it where anybody was going to hear him. <laughs> but, and I'm I'm not even trying to be political today and say Democrats are bad and Republicans are good. I'm not even trying to say that. I'm just making a point. We're at a very dangerous place in our country where it is just openly acceptable now to be anti-Semitic, where one of our political parties is just acknowledged as the party that doesn't accept Jews and throws a fit whenever a Jewish leader comes to visit and, def- and they start defacing our own monuments and stuff. That is satanically motivated. They literally chose the Hamas terrorists over the Jewish victims. That is demonic. That's outright demonic. And by the way, the party who acts that way, they are the, pow- the party who's in control right now. So we are in dark times. We're, we're not, you know, people say, oh, this election is going to decide the fate of the nation and all, you know, you, you hear that every election year. We're already in dark times, guys. <laughs> Regardless of how this November goes, we're already in a pit. So I would say that God's words to the Edomites in Ezekiel 35, it might apply to the modern anti-Semites just as well. Okay, God said, I have heard all the revilings that you uttered against the mountains of Israel. God is saying he heard those things. And then one of the Democratic congresswomen this week, Rashida Tlaib, she's a blatant anti-Semite. And she held up a sign while Netanyahu was speaking that said, war criminal. Because his nation was attacked last year, and she's saying that he has retaliated by going too far. So he's a war criminal in her eyes. And yet, to this day, the Palestinians have still not surrendered all of their hostages. She is not complaining about the Jewish and even American hostages who are still held by Hamas right now. Instead, she's going to hold up a sign that says war criminal about the guy who is trying to get those hostages back. All because he's Jewish. Well, listen to what God said in this chapter. Okay, Rashida Tlaib, if you listen to this podcast today, God says, I have heard all the revilings that you uttered against the mountains of Israel. If you remember last year on October 7th, throughout the world after that horrible thing happened, there were people who were celebrating it when they saw how Israel got attacked so brutally by those Palestinian Hamas terrorists. There were people celebrating it all over the planet. Mostly it was Muslims celebrating it. But there were people of all races across the world happy about what happened in Israel. But there were lots of people all across the world who were happy about what happened in Israel on that day. And this invites God's judgment. Look again at what God said in Ezekiel 35. While the whole earth rejoices, I will make you desolate. As you rejoiced over the inheritance of the house of Israel because it was desolate, so I deal with you. People need to be careful about what they say. God is listening. God is watching. God will deal with them. Thanks for listening to the Cross References Bible Study on the book of Ezekiel. This has been Luke Taylor, and I hope the Bible makes more sense to you after this episode.